Okay. All right. We'll call our meeting of the Florida Water Rights Commissioners to order. Um, we'll start. We'll start with the pledge. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the and republic, republic for which it stands. God. God. Somehow I'm getting duplicate cameras here that says council chamber, but I'm showing up on that. And Mark was just showing up on that. And, hmm. Interesting. All right, we need a motion to approve the minutes of our meeting from October 19th. So moved. I second it. And we moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Fair votes aye. All right. Financial reports. Everyone should have received copies of those financial reports. You only want to give a few highlights. Well, you can see for the month of October, <clears throat> our billing was uh, uh, increased. Uh, that's primarily due to the rate increase that went into effect on the 1st of October. Um, we did actually, as you see later, pump about 2.5% less water, but that was offset by that, that rate increase. Um, you can see... Uh, for the year to date total, we're, we're still significantly down. Um, Sheboygan Falls, uh, uh, although uh, has uh, used uh, more than last year, a lot of that has to do with whether the Bemis um, recirculating system is up and running. That's my, my guess, uh, what's behind that increase for them. Uh, Sheboygan itself and, and the village of Kohler were, were down in their uh, total billing for 2020 to date. Um, rate of return is starting to uh, go back up a little bit. It, it is being impacted still by the year-to-date totals, but I, I think we'll see that recover as we go along. Um, the cash reserve remains healthy and, and uh, as anticipated. Um, I don't have any other comments on that. Um, and then uh, that would be my summary of the monthly financials. All right. Any questions for Joe on the financials at all? None for me, thank you. Not here, nope. All right. So on to operations, construction, maintenance, and customer relations. Bring up my report here. If you could give me a minute. Thought I had it, but it doesn't seem like I do. So let me open it again. If it helps us thunderboard docs. Okay. Almost there. Okay. <clears throat> I'll start with uh, the R and F. You can see for October compared to last year, uh, total payments are, are down about 360 total payments. We are still seeing more late or, or non-paying customers. Um, you can see calls coming in again are uh, well below last year. 
account transfers, kind of interesting, are, are up. So those are people moving in and out of different places. Uh, no PSC complaints for the month. Uh, we had the 71000 almost $72,000 outstanding at the end of the month for District 3 in collections. Um, you can see our service techs uh, out in the field are approaching their prior year's uh, driving totals, more, more activity out in the field is what's being indicated there. Uh, we did have two leak allowances come through and, and were approved. Um, uh, 2,800 visitors to the website and some highlights, including Commissioner Smith's uh, handcrafted water meter lamp was a highlight. <laughs> and uh, well deserved. Um, otherwise, <laughs> um, otherwise, some highlights. Uh, we did uh, implement. As approved by the PSC, uh, we're no longer charging for credit card usage. We're now allowed to roll that expense into our overall fiscal expenses, so that's a big change. Um, we did have some uh, our utility support specialists attended a customer service seminar remotely and, and found it to be worthwhile. Um, we have had to suspend our Orion, the radio read meters uh, installation program due to the pandemic. We still have about 1,100 to complete the system, and I think we'll achieve that goal next year. Um, and then, as, as we'll see later, but I'll uh, remind the board that the Public Service Commission did extend the moratorium on disconnections until April 15th. Um, they've uh, stretched that out a little. Uh, initially, it was the end of the year, and now it's been extended to the end of the, end of the first quarter of 2021. Um, in distribution, we had a fairly quiet month. One, one water main break at the 1421 North 17th Street, which the crew repaired. I would say that I, uh, you, you may recall uh, earlier this year, we bought an electronic leak correlator device uh, to help locate water main breaks. And the crew members are really pretty excited about it. They've been able to pinpoint leaks. Uh, you know, previously they had to drill holes, put things down, try to listen with stethoscopes and hear the water and sort of triangulate on the location manually and now they're able to use this electronic system and are having very good results with it. Um, some work out at the Georgia Avenue standpipe, the, the water tower that was stripped and painted. Uh, the crew did remove what's uh, called an altitude valve that had been in there since that pipe, that standpipe was uh, constructed. And these are a mechanical uh, a valve that when the, the tank is full of water, they, they shut so as to prevent overflowing of the tank. Um, but those have, are kind of an outdated, uh, now that we have electronic monitoring on water levels and such, we don't really need those. And, and often they fail after time, they're, they're kind of a maintenance issue. So we removed that uh, from the standpipe while it was out of service. The crew was able to do that. Um, uh, we did install an eight inch tap for future water service at Acuity. This was off of uh, Union Avenue there where the hospital construction is. Um, and some cleanup on the shoreline restoration project behind the filter plant. And I rounded out the highlights for distribution. Eight inch tap seems pretty impressive for one facility, doesn't it? Yeah, I think uh, they, they're sort of planning for additions. Uh, we're not exactly sure what else, but yeah, it's a very large tap there to, to go into that large parcel. Um, in operations, as I mentioned, we produced about two and a half percent less water than last year in October. 
um, no exact explanation for that. That's just kind of, uh, you know, routine variations in water usage, I would say. Uh, year to date high lift average, we're at 11.7 million gallons a day. Uh, last year we were 12.7, 12, 12 so you can see that that figure has been dropping. So we are producing less water. Uh, again, this year with the pandemic, that definitely affected that number. Um, but we do have a three year trend of that decreasing now, which is uh, not what we'd like to see, but that's where we're at. And <clears throat> otherwise, uh, for October, a lot of maintenance in the plant. Um, you can see a, a variety of things going on. Uh, we did start cleaning the, the south base and normally fall. Oh, <laughs> technical difficulty. Anybody there? Yeah, Joel. Joel is frozen. Joel, Joel. Froze up. yeah. Coming back, though. <laughs> and I think that. I'm sorry. Oh, we lost it up there for a while. Okay, how about now? Well, now you're better. Good. Okay. We lost you when you were talking about uh, maintenance in the plant. Okay, okay. yeah. I was just, uh, yeah, just indicating that usually when we take those basins out of service, we do have some maintenance issues in them due to the mechanical mixers uh, underwater. Um, I think that's the highlights of the superintendent's reports. All right. Any questions for Joe on any of his reports? Yeah, Joe, what's that picture that's included there? That photo, yes, uh, thanks for reminding me. That is our uh, sluice gate that was installed in the clear well. And uh, a little background when we built the ultraviolet system we had to uh, extend the clear well in a new direction so that it would drain to the uv system instead of directly to high lift um, when we did that however we realized that we might want to bypass around uv in the future uh, so we wanted to install the sluice gate which goes over the, the pathway to the ultraviolet system uh, and now with it in place, we can uh, essentially bypass UV if we needed to and shut off and isolate the clear well, which is where we contain, uh, contain our finished water. So that sluice gate was installed last month. Um, you can see it was a pretty tight fit uh, and uh, divers went in, installed it, uh, checked that it was functional and we now are able to isolate the clear well, which was our, our goal on that project. Cool. A lot of different things down there that people don't always see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments for Joe on his report? No, sir. Yes, for me. Uh, entertain a motion to approve uh, the reports. So moved. I second it. All in favor say aye. 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 And the chair votes aye. All right. Uh, items previously held over for discussion. Raw water improvement. Uh, <clears throat> so here we're talking about the, uh, the intake and, and the suction well, low lift pump station project. Uh, we did complete preliminary design uh, and you had an update from CDM Smith last month on that. Um, one thing I wanted to add to that is a little bit of information about uh, the FEMA uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure Grant Program. Um, 
we've been looking more into that. It is a grant program for um, infrastructure projects and in particular related to um, resilient projects in the face of high water levels or shoreline damage or um, issues like that. Um, so in our project, we really considered at the beginning the shoreline protection system that would be needed uh, to build where we would like to build because we're right on the shoreline uh, and we do know that the waves can damage and erode the shoreline and we want to avoid that. Um, so we have, uh, as part of the preliminary design, a shoreline uh, armor system that would that would go in into construction, and uh, has significant cost. About one to three million dollars is a very rough estimate for that at this point. Um, so between uh, the utility accountant, myself, and the operations supervisor, we've attended a number of meetings on the FEMA BRIC program. Um, uh, we've entertained two ideas. One would be to try to apply for the entire project. And the second would be to try to apply for just simply the shoreline protection element of the project. Uh, we did get some uh, feedback from uh, a consulting company called Stantec that has been working with FEMA and the Great Lakes Initiative Group. Um, and I think uh, what we came to realize in, in discussions with them would be that in order to apply for the entire project, we really don't have time to do that for 2021. We could do that potentially for 2022. Uh, we do feel we have time to apply for the limited, the shoreline armor part of the project for 2021, and we're continuing to pursue that. Um, there, there's a, a benefit to risk ratio or, or kind of a analysis that has to be done by the state to decide even if you want to go through the gate. If you don't have a suffic sufficient benefit to, to uh, risk, then uh, their advice is don't, don't even bother because you're not going to get, you're just basically going to waste your time. Um, so we have most of the information we need to provide that and have provided some of that to the state. Um, so our goal is to apply for the shoreline protection for 2021 and see what happens. And, for the whole country, the, the uh, funding figure is about $600 million, which of course is a lot of money, but over 50 states, it's not that much money. Um, what, what is our chance of getting grant for that portion? We really don't know. It's, it's a new program, it's impossible to say. My, my own feeling is that we have a better chance to get a smaller portion than for the entire project, but I think we'll, we'll see what happens with the, the shoreline protection portion. Uh, and as we learn more, maybe we'll feel like we would recommend applying for the whole project or maybe not. I, uh, you know, grants are challenging. They're always a little enticing, but then as you get into details, it becomes harder and harder and Again, the, the chance of funding the whole project with a federal BRIC grant, I think, is fairly small, but it, it isn't zero. Um, that's kind of a, a status of what we've been doing in the last month on, on the RWI, more on the funding aspect of it. Well, actually, the shoreline protection would be um, from a risk to benefit um, analysis probably more so than the, than the whole project. That's part of our thinking as well. Right. Okay. Any questions for Joel on, on that part of our agenda? No. Um, Not for me. Okay. Nothing good. Thanks. What was that? This is, excuse me. I was clearing my throat. 
Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, review the uh, RWI final design proposal. Um, so to, to backtrack a little bit, we began this project actually in 2004 with some field work and we did some underwater work and, and started to prioritize the project, uh, had other projects of higher priority ahead of it. And uh, several years ago, then we uh, embarked on the feasibility study of this project with CDM Smith out of Chicago. Uh, we've now completed the uh, preliminary design portion of the project on time and uh, per the, the engineering budget. And I think uh, certainly staff, myself, have been very happy with the work done by CDM Smith. Um, they did team with a, our local engineering firm, Donahue and Associates, in a very significant way. Um, and they also brought in Collins Engineering out of Milwaukee, who has uh, especially coastal engineering expertise. Um, so it really is a teamed uh, effort. It isn't just CDM Smith, it's a team. CDM Smith, Donahue, and Collins to a, a lesser degree. Um, when we embarked on the preliminary design, uh, CDM Smith provided a kind of an overall proposal and assessment of the project. And at that point in time, they felt that due to a lot of unknowns, it would not be in anybody's uh, benefit or, or uh, favor to try to come up with a consulting engineering fee for the whole project. It, it just was too complicated and too many unknowns. Um, so they initially gave us a proposal for the preliminary design work, which again was just completed. And then they gave us estimates for final design, including bidding, and then construction engineering, or uh, what we might call inspection of the construction phase of the project. So at this point in time, we're, we're ready and, and eager to move into detailed design, or what I would call final design and bidding. Uh, we do have a time frame with the state of Wisconsin one of our potential funding sources is the safe drinking water loan through the state. And in order to apply for that, we need an engineering, a final engineering report by the end of June of 2021. So we have a reasonable amount of time, but not, uh, uh, not extra time, I would say. So what you have before you now is uh, CDM's proposal for the detailed design and bidding uh, phase of the project. <clears throat> and you can see it involves a detailed design kickoff. Now, one thing that emerged that, again, we didn't exactly anticipate, uh, they're showing on page 1-1, task one, which is field and other investigations. And I think at the end of the day, I, to summarize this, is that they're recommending that we not rely on the underwater data that was taken in 2004 um, entirely. They're not saying it, is, it was not worthwhile. It actually allowed us to lay out the path that we're on now, but they feel that that time lapse creates enough uncertainty that bidders are going to look at that and say, uh, that's pretty old data. What if the lake uh, subsurface has changed significantly and we run into things that we didn't anticipate? Uh, and, and the concern is that they're going to have to put risk into their bids to offset that, to put dollars into their bids to offset that, and that those dollars are probably going to be pretty significant. Um, so what CDM has included is additional underwater, uh, five additional underwater borings into the subsurface, uh, along with uh, more of a like a sonar echo uh, survey, a bathymetric survey as it's called, to establish the, the lake uh, 
bed all the way from the shoreline out 7,000 feet. So that cost is, uh, is about uh, $285,000. Um, when we embarked on the project, you know, we didn't, we weren't sure if we would need to do that again. Uh, they're recommending that we do that and that work would actually be subbed out to STS, uh, but that is included in the scope, which again was one of those things that we maybe didn't think we would need up front. We, we could reject that element, but I think the risk in doing that is, is probably uh, the, the benefit of doing it is, is, is pretty high. Does anybody have any questions just about that other field work aspect of, of the detailed design? No, that makes perfect sense to me. We also. Yep. No, I don't have. You know, it does involve them bringing out a barge and, and drilling off of it again, but not as extensively as the first time when customers thought maybe we were drilling for oil or something out there. But <laughs> it was similar to that activity. Um, detailed design, final design, permitting. I don't have a, a whole lot more to say about that. Task five, WDNR safe uh, drinking water revolving fund support. They're talking about the documents needed for us to apply for the loan program, <clears throat> bidding services and project management up uh, through the end of bidding. Um, I think they have all the details laid out here. I won't go through everything. Well, one of the aspects they are including um, it's quite a bit of hydraulic analysis on, on the actual intake structure and also the, the shore well structure where water comes in to the pumps to avoid you know, unnecessary turbulence or, or issues there. So they actually have included computational fluid dynamics modeling along with physical models. There's a lab at uh, Clemson that specializes in making a physical model of our shore well uh, and assessing if, if we have a, a nice non-turbulent alignment of our pumps and our structure. Um, they would continue the 3D model. We saw a, a little bit of that earlier. The board wasn't able to see that in great detail, but it does uh, allow you to step into the station, look around uh, and see things that maybe you like or maybe you dislike. Um, the design would include a new 54 inch intake out to a distance of 7,000 feet with two al alternate materials, a, a concrete uh, uh, pipe and steel pipe. From all of the yard pipe work necessary to connect it up. Um, again, the shoreline protection by Collins engineers, overall civil and site uh, improvements. Um, the raw water pump station with traveling screens, pumps, electrical room, two gas, uh, natural gas backup generators, and, and one uh, chemical feed room. Uh, a new electrical service. Uh, however, we would retain our current rate structure, which is, is favorable. Um, two items that have emerged as alternates that you know, we're not sure we can afford or wish to spend money on or not, but one is a second or what we're calling the redundant emergency intake a thousand feet out. Um, if we want CDM to design that, that's a bit of additional cost. And then also an intake heating and camera system. And this would be heating at the very intake um, uh, grading structure and a camera at that same location so that we can see more of what's happening out there. Um, you know, a number of meetings as you would expect, most probably all those will be remote and that's been working out fine. Um, updates on the opinion of probable construction costs at 60 and 90%. Um, a time frame, November, 
through June 2021. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a very detailed layout of the deliverables in terms of drawing numbers and drawing details and all the permitting, uh, both state and local efforts. Uh, and then the bidding, you know, this is a, a I'd call it a fairly unusual project. So we need, uh, we certainly need assistance to bid it out properly and to get to get good competitive uh, bids, and hopefully many of them. Um, they did include in, in Exhibit A a breakdown of hours and fee, and of course we've reviewed that and. Yeah. You know, there's, there's nothing there that I would flag as, as unnecessary or that appears to me out of line. Um, they do give a breakdown even of, of how much would be in, in Donahue's portion of the project, which is about $430,000. And again, about uh, 285 to STS for the, the underwater work. And you can see some of those breakdowns as well. Uh, the design work for the optional or the emergency intake is about a $47,000 extra. And the de design work for the heater and camera system is about a $35,000 extra. And then at the very end, they have the uh, 124 different drawing sheets laid out already in anticipation of how that's going to be structured. And I think the only other reference I would make, I, I did send some uh, uh, a summary of the co engineering costs uh, previously so that the board could see. And I think, <clears throat> As the project has been fleshed out, it has grown significantly. Our current estimate is about a $35 million project. You know, that's still an engineer's opinion of probable construction costs, and I feel that that uh, is still conservative, but it has grown from what we thought initially. And I think the engineering uh, costs by percentage have decreased. So that we're now at about a 14% figure is, is what we would estimate. Um, and certainly, um, you know, it's very significant engineering cost. And I think breaking it down as we've done is, is really the, the best way to try to ensure that we're getting a good project and, and not getting things or services that we don't need. Um, my, my own recommendation is that CDM has done an outstanding job of working with our team and really considering a lot of options. They're very open to our input. Um, you know, they have sometimes the tough job of telling us, well, you know, that would be nice, but you know, here's what it's gonna cost if, if we do everything that you might want to do. Uh, but I think we have very good communications with them and they certainly have the expertise that we need to move forward with the project um, and they've demonstrated a very high level of commitment to the project and also an ability to manage the team. I think they're working with Donahue and others in a very cohesive manner and I really uh, uh, would only have a positive recommendation about continuing uh, to work with them. So I think that's that's my summary summary of the proposal that we have before us tonight. What do you think about those options, Joe? Um, I think we should pursue both options is my recommendation. The, the camera uh, is not as critical. We could potentially save a few thousand dollars by having the camera removed. But I think in, one issue with heaters, and you know, I think you're very aware of some of these issues, Mark, but there's not a lot of experience with intake heaters. There's a few, there's one 
small company that is has some installations and word of mouth and anecdotal evidence is that they seem to be effective. But there isn't like an array of different options and vendors that are providing intake heaters at this point. But I feel like it's very it's very inefficient to do something like that after the fact. Right, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. You know, we, we can't guarantee that the heater is going to mean we don't ever have icing at that intake that we can't manage. But if we don't put it there, we'll we'll never be able to put it there. I guess I would put it that way. So I would, I would actually recommend both options. I was uh, thinking along the same lines as far as the heaters. One thing I would imagine they must be a maintenance pain in the neck though. The way the uh, water movement and whatnot, they must get knocked off and we do an annual inspection. I would just expect that we might have maintenance on them as well. Yeah, the most successful installation has been at Evanston, Illinois, and, and they've been very positive about it. Um, but the, it's only been in place, you know, five to seven years. So I, I think you're exactly right. We would expect ongoing maintenance with it. And my understanding mind. is that they simply, when, when the water temperature gets to about 34, they just turn it on and leave it on. Yeah, if, you, if we go through this huge project, planning for the future, and we freeze it up somewhere, we're gonna wish we had done this. And I'm assuming, I mean, between the, the, the heater and the camera, um, there's gotta be some protection to those pieces of equipment if in case there were a problem down the road. Yeah, I think they make every effort to, to make them rugged, but you know, it is harsh conditions and uh, I think they, after 10 years, 15 years, I would definitely expect maintenance. But one point I do want the board to understand, um, with our current intake well and intakes, the, the well is very small. And when we do have ice buildup, what, what we're able to do is put water, you know, as we take water out of the well, the level goes down. Uh, when we have icing, what we do is we dump water from our wash tank up on the hill into the shore well, increase the, the height of water, and we essentially push water out the intake. And that helps dislodge uh, ice that is, isn't built up too much. Now, the new intake well is, is size is much larger. The intake itself is much larger we're not going to be able to dump water onto it and do that same back flushing as we call it. Um, it would take a huge amount of water to do that and it's just not available to us. And that's another argument why we need the, the heater, I think, because we're not going to have that back flushing capability any longer. On, we'll still have it on the old one in service, but it's just not viable on this new installation. We're looking, we're looking at something that we're hoping is going to last for 50 years plus. Um, to skimp at, at this time, you know, not knowing what's going to happen you know, even 10, 15 years from now, and you, you definitely want to be proactive and make sure that we're covering you know, for any future possibilities. So. And I think the only optional element that I could identify, again, is that that bathymetric and underwater drilling portion. I, you know, the board could determine that, that that isn't something to be invested in and we could pull that out and, and bid the project. Um, and I, I guess I tried to explain the, the risk that we might end up paying for if we, if we do that, but that's about the only other optional element I could envision here. I think your explanation of the reason for that was was right on as well, Joe. Anytime there's more risk, then you're going to get more spread in the bids, and the spread is going to go towards the right side of the chart, not the left side. Mm -hmm. But I think both uh, operation supervisors Swearingen and and I have have reviewed the proposal. And, and we feel comfortable and, and confident in it and would, would recommend it to the board. 
So we need to take action tonight. Yeah. That was my question as well. I'm sorry, was there a question there? I didn't catch that. Yeah, I just said, is that something we need to take action tonight on, on a proposal? Um, I would recommend it because that June deadline is looming and, and we would like to get started. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Uh, nothing from me, thank you. Not from me either. Do we have a motion to... Uh, uh, accept Joe's uh, recommendation. I would move that we do so. I will second that. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Joe, excellent job. You, you and Bill. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next on the agenda is uh, chemical bids for 2021. Yes, so we have our uh, <clears throat> tabulation of annual bids for aluminum sulfate fluoride, hypochlorite, and, and liquid phosphate. Um, and we have recommendations at the bottom. I, I guess the only thing I would note here, the aluminum sulfate, there is a, an iron-free grade and a food grade and we would recommend, because the cost difference is not very large, to go with the food grade uh, this year. We've done that in the past when the cost has been reasonable to do so. And I think otherwise we were comfortable with the, the low bidders um, as presented here. So just for my edification, what's the difference between the food grade and the iron-free grade? Well, the food grade is is um, certified for use in the food industry. So I think it's guaranteed to a higher level of purity. Um, you know, aluminum sulfate uh, is added early as a pretreatment chemical mm -hmm. and, and mostly is settled out in sedimentation. Um, so the, the iron-free grade, you know, can have a higher level of... Um, Uh, I'd say additional components that are, are certainly not harmful, but that end up in our sludge and we okay. have to remove. Most public utilities use the iron free grade, but we uh, kind of discovered the food grade was available to us and just felt more comfortable with it and have been bidding that for the past few years. And basically we use it as a flocculant? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, I would make so. a motion. I would make a motion to approve uh, all uh, as as recommended by the uh, Joe. Yeah, I agree. I would second that. Uh, one thing that's just taking note of the cost increase in the fluoride is interesting, but that doesn't stop my my uh, seconding the motion. Yeah, we've had trouble getting, as you can see, much co competitive bidding on, on these chemicals in, in the past few years. And uh, we don't really have a whole lot of uh, control to extend the market to chemicals because of their, their bulk nature. It's kind of a radius of operation around us that we can bid into and it seems to be becoming more and more limited. Hmm. Any other comments or questions? All right. No, not for me. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And chair votes aye. All right. Our bankruptcy is in write offs. So, utility accountant Gutsucker has prepared a, a list of. Um, basically uncollectible accounts at this point that we're recommending write off. Majority of it is sewer and garbage fees and recycling fees. Huh? When you look at it. 
yeah, the water portion is 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 smaller, and then uh, I guess to be uh, accurate, we're recommending to uh, the city right off of those other fees if they wish to pursue them on their own, they're able to do that. Right. Is there a motion to approve? Yes, sir. I will move so. I'll second it. All in favor say aye. 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 And sure will say. All right. Make payment charges. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> you have uh, two documents from the Public Service Commission, and as they've been adjusting to the, the current situation, they've decided to extend the moratorium on disconnections through April 15th, and uh, basically that means public utilities are no longer able to disconnect customers for non-payment. And we're certainly abiding by that. Um, next month, you should have a report on, on amounts going to the tax roll. It certainly is increased. Um, disconnection does result in, in people paying. Um, but I think the PSC is reflecting the current economic hardship of many of our customers by uh, extending that moratorium. Um, the portion. Excuse me, the portion for the board's consideration is really uh, what to do about late fees. Um, as, as per the PSC guidelines, uh, <clears throat> utilities may continue to waive late fees in a non discriminatory manner until April 15th as well. On the other hand, utilities could continue to impose late fees and make them collectible at, at that later point in time. Um, I did ask, uh, accountant that sucker as well for an estimate if we were to waive those late fees um, how many dollars would we expect that to be? And I'm just going to pull that up here. Yeah, I almost have it. And what she did was looked at our last uh, several years and came up with a calculation of about $27,000 uh, if we do not impose those late fees uh, through April 15th. So that's our estimate of what that would embody. So my, uh, um, I guess I'm asking the board for action on whether or not the utility should waive those late fees or impose them for um, compliance in, in April 15th, 2021. Are those dollars, if if indeed they're not paid, are they added onto the tax bill? Onto the, the... Uh, yes, at the end of next year, they would be added onto the tax bill. So the late fees would be along with the, any pass through water charges? Correct. And sewer charges and garbage charges and what have you, depending on what the city does. Correct. Any thoughts, Mark? Um, I, I was what, is this, what is this, what the city is doing? Sorry. Well, the, the city isn't really, isn't uh, 
regulated by the Public Service Commission, so they they could maintain late uh, fees uh, if they if they wanted us to do that on their behalf for sewer and garbage um, collection. Right. So they don't um, they, they don't have to abide by the PSC. They haven't given us any direction on what they'd want want to do with those things either, right? Not at this point, no. So what are your thoughts, Joe? Uh, well, my thoughts are that we do have a number of customers who are facing economic challenges uh in, in a very unusual situation and i think anything that could be done to reflect that is 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 a benefit so you know my feeling would be in in favor of waiving those late charges for uh, that limited period of time so from my experience working for the utility we were uh, all of our customers, including the customers here in Sheboygan, in the city of Sheboygan, about 25% of our customers were having trouble paying their utility bills on a month to month basis. And that was before this economic and virus thing started. So I can definitely see where that would continue or even accelerate as far as economic impacts on customers. I'm wondering if we decide to uh, be kind and the city decides not to be kind, I wonder how that plays out. Not necessarily that we, we have to worry about what the city's doing, but it might put the uh, city in an awkward position when people see that on their bills. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a factor, I, I think. Um, our accountant's mm -hmm. figure, I'm sure, is very conservative. Yeah. You know, maybe it would be more like twenty thousand um, dollars. But as we know, the sewer and, and garbage collection fees are are higher than the water fees, so they may be, you know, it may be more like thirty thousand dollars of late fees on on those charges. I don't think that should necessarily be a driver for a decision. Just the city might have some planning to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Tom, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, I'm okay with waving, waving those fees. It's, it's, you know, as a total of the total number of dollars, it's a pretty small percentage. From my experience with the utility, there's one thing that's kind of gnawing at me a little bit, and that is the fairness factor for those who are able to make their payments and who don't and take advantage of the situation. Meanwhile, there are those who are who are struggling and yet are making their payments and it's not really fair to them to cut slack to others. And I still see what you're saying, Joe. It's just a it's just a thought because being a regulated monopoly, we're always in that situation of trying to be fair. Well, I guess it could be argued that by <clears throat> by delaying or the, the disconnection moratorium means that essentially people don't uh, have to pay those bills until later, and they're they're getting more time. And if that results in having some additional fees, uh, maybe that's not ideal. But they have had more time, and and that is at least a factor. If we don't waive the fees, does that preclude us from not forgiving them down the road, even on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, yeah, the PSC wants, we actually have to report to them, what are, what are we going to do? Okay. So they want to know. And they want a non-discriminatory matter. Non-discriminatory, exactly. Right. I guess I would make a motion agreeing with uh, the two of you that um, uh, we uh, waive the fees, um, the late fees, 
at this time? You're never wrong to be kind. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, did we budget for this? I mean, do we budget for the late fees as income? Uh, typically, yeah, we do include that uh, them as income, but I would say, you know, within the <clears throat> level of uh, uncertainty in the budget, the $20,000 deficit, if, if it ends up being that much, is, is not going to be a huge factor. Okay. Is there a second to my motion for further discussion? <laughs> I will second, I'll second it. All right. Further I'll discussion. Start. <laughs> okay. uh, no further further. All right, we've got a motion and a second to um, inform the PSC that we will be waiving late fees, and then we will just have to see what the city wants to do with um, their portion of uh, our water bill. And I think that went down as unanimous, is that correct? We haven't taken a vote yet. Volunteers yeah, okay. say aye. Yeah, Tom and I were fighting aye. over second, so that's probably unanimous. Yeah. Aye. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Aye. Sure now it is unanimous, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any PSC code changes? 5.5 uh, on our agenda? No, just the moratorium. Okay. 5.6, uh, approving vouchers. I would make a motion to approve the vouchers as presented. And second. Further discussion? Uh, I assume you got my email, Jerry, with my... To Tom. Okay. Yeah, nice, that's a Joe. Okay, all right. Good. All in favor say aye. 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 And chair votes aye. Section six, personnel, 6.1, review plans regarding COVID-19 risk reduction. Um, just an update report. We have had several staff members now with positive tests and, <clears throat> and they have been out of the workplace very quickly. Uh, I think in all cases actually uh, fell on a weekend when they began having symptoms and promptly got tested and uh, I'm confident we did not have spread in the workplace. Um, but with the numbers in the county getting so, so high, I'm not surprised. I, when I did a, just a calculation of the percentage of positive cases in the county based on population and the number of cases we've had at the utility, there's similar percentages, so I'm not surprised. Um, None of that has affected our ability to complete our core missions. Uh, we have had to shuffle staff a little bit, make some adjustments. I'd say right now we're in kind of a high protective mode. The pay window remains closed. Uh, we are cycling staff on remote work whenever possible. Um, we do have some folks needing to take COVID leave as schools are, are going remote again in some cases. Um, but I think our system is, is robust and I think uh, things are looking, looking good uh, at the moment. Is there one area in the, in the um, workforce that is uh, that the cases are more prevalent? Um, not really. We we had two cases on on the construction crew, but I don't think we have any any pattern to okay to, to show. Okay, and and for the like I say, those people haven't been working, and so we don't think it was contracted in here. It was contracted elsewhere in, in their that's, lifestyles or what have you. So, that's okay. my belief, and and we have emphasized, and our, yeah. our staff have been very strong about going in and getting tests as soon as there's a concern. Okay. Um, and that's been very good. And our staff has been, you know, really embraced all of our safety measures early on. And I think doing everything they can to stay healthy. I, I just think with the numbers getting higher and higher, it's inevitable that we're, we're going to see, you know, a few cases 
um, other city departments, as we know, are having. Remotely, those we're kind of alternating, um, those that are in in house as well as working um, remotely. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Any other further questions or comments? No. Not for me. All right. Reviewing wage proposal. Bill provided a proposal to all of us and um, with uh, numbers that uh, you know, he had come up with and Lisa had also come up with as far as uh, increases um, to the workforce. Any questions or comments uh, from the commissioners? I think a comment would be in order about the level of service that's been provided by the staff and the cooperation with the efforts to keep the staff safe so we can have an effective and safe water supply in Sheboygan, Sheboygan Falls and Kohler are much appreciated. And that level of cooperation and uh, maturity is something we should recognize. Uh, I have done research uh, for other organizations I'm involved with uh, and looked at what what's going on in um, you know, not only the, the government area, but also the nonprofit area and the, uh, the private sector. And what Joe is proposing um, is probably even a little bit less than what is showing up um, elsewhere as far as the percentage of increase we're talking about across the board. And I echo all your comments there, Mark. Um, and I'm sure Tom feels the same way. We are responsible for the health and welfare of not only the people of Sheboygan, but city of Sheboygan Falls and the village of Kohler, uh, which is very, very important. And we've been able to do that without any, any problems. And everyone should be commended. I agree. I think I would just add to summarize that, you know, again, this is a unique year in, in our history. And in the past, I've been very happy with our, our five tier performance evaluation system. And I think it's worked well. But I, I just think everybody at the utility this year has performed at a very high level. And I just couldn't uh, recommend trying to you know, break down wage increases this year based on, on performance because I really think everybody uh, showed their commitment to the community and to the water utility and, and to their their duties and, and really everybody uh, performed at a high level this year. I think we agree. I agree. With that in mind, uh... We've got a motion to approve uh, wage increases uh, as proposed by Joe. All in favor say aye. 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 Fair votes aye. Thank you, Joe, for um, your comments, your thoughts, and putting that together. Thank you. All right. Item number seven on our agenda is setting a date for our next meeting which we're looking at December. The third Monday would be the 21st. Just in time for, for Christmas cheer. Yeah, works for me. Okay by me. Mark, how's it work in your schedule? It work, it's, it's already there. It's already there. All right. If that Great. is it, our next meeting will be on the 21st of December. 3.30 again? Yep. Okay. okay. And thanks to uh, the staff at City Hall for um, getting this arranged and getting it taken care of. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving, and I will move to adjourn. I second that. I second it. <laughs> We're good. All right.
Thank you, gentlemen. Happy Thanksgiving.